Hi everyone, thanks for coming. So it's my pleasure to introduce Yan Xin Wu today. Uh, Yan Xin completed her undergrad degree at the University of Science and Technology in China. Uh, she then obtained her PhD from Caltech, uh, spent some time as a postdoc at Queen Mary College, University of London and CETA at the University of Toronto. And she joined the faculty of the astronomy department at the University of Toronto. And personally, it's really nice to have Yan Xin here because many of us uh, spent a lot of time at the University of Toronto and we got to know her very well. <coughs> That's very nice. Um, and Yan Xin's, we were all joking that maybe we got scarred from the winters in <laughs> Toronto. <laughs> and we always came right. to Arizona. Right. We flocked here. Um, yeah. Yan Xin's research interests are really wide, they cover a wide range of topics maybe all related to planets, uh, including the interiors of Jovian planets, planets in binary systems, circumstellar, the Redis, board gas, uh, and dust, the Pluto Charon system, and the primordial, Kuiperville. Uh, but today we're going to, to we're gonna learn about the uniform population of super-Earths. So please join me in welcoming Yan Chin. Well, thanks for coming. Uh I was telling uh, all my Torontonian friends here that uh, somehow Arizona get all the best people that come out of Toronto. <laughs> and there are quite a few of them, really surprising. Anyway, um, and I also have the honor to have uh, the youngest audience in this uh, <laughs> ever, uh, I ever had. So I don't know if I can entertain <coughs> that. But thank you for being this audience. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about is Kepler planet. Um, this is something I've been working on for the past five, six years, probably even longer than I want to admit. But this is a good time to give a talk because the uh, past couple of years we have made some interesting um, observations about these planets, which hopefully lead to a deeper insight about how planets form. I was told that today is a, some people told me that today is a bad day for talk because the observers uh, went to the PAC meeting um, for NORAO. So presumably there are a lot of theorists here, which means I can pretend to be the observer. <laughs> <laughs> so this talk is really observational. <laughs> uh, first by saying uh, two things about uh, what we think, how the solar system formed, and then I'll spend the rest of the talk shutting it down, okay? <laughs> so the first thing is that this is an astronomy 101 thing that uh, planets uh, care about this fictional line called the ice line. Outside the ice line, there's a lot of solid material where you can combine them to make a core of a planet. So therefore, if you see any kind of giant planets, they should be obeying the ice line. And the other thing about the solar system formation story also tell us that if you do see any kind of planets, they should like metal-rich environments because there's more solids. Before I kill them, I'll show you two evidences which we have known for a very long time that support these <coughs> pictures. But I think the new observation from Kepler is challenging the interpretation of these observations. Okay. The first piece of observation is where the giant planets <coughs> are, so distances versus um, numbers. And you can see, well, indeed, giant planets do care about some kind of imaginary line there in space. They don't like to be inside one AU. <coughs> okay, that seems like a qualified success, there may be some ice line story behind it. The other piece of evidence, which we also know for a very long time, the giant planets exist preferentially in metal-rich systems. It's a very steep dependence in the sense that if you ask <coughs> average stars, what's the chance of a giant planet, the probability goes up like metallicity to the square power. Okay. Both of these make sense, but this new population, which I call the Kepler planet, came about quite many years now. This is the green stars here, um, plotted in orbital period, <coughs> horizontal axis, and vertical axis is called planet mass, but that's an that's a illusion because we actually don't know mass of many of these planets, so it's really some kind of proxy for mass. So, but you can see this green dots lie between, between um, typically we call them between one to four Earth's radii. Um, this is about one Earth radii, that's about four Earth radii, and there's some concentration of planets in the sense that up here there are very few planets, but there's a large concentration of planets. So they prefer their sizes. This uh, also have an orbital period which is closer than planets in our own solar system, so 
the closest one is less than a day, and then they sort of resigned for about a couple of decades, or as far as we can tell, they resigned close to the start. This is where the Earth is, and beyond <coughs> that, they may still exist, but we run out of observational patience to find them. Okay. So this is what I call Kepler planets, and I'll exclusively discuss what we learned about them the past, past couple of years. Um, obviously, we don't have such planets in our own solar system. You can say, well, Earth is, uh, isn't the Earth at the edge? Is the Earth, Earth is sort of at the edge of this uh, distribution, isn't it? Why don't you call Earth a Kepler system? It turns out Earth is distinctively different. All the Kepler planets are distinctively different from terrestrial objects. So we don't have the system. The other thing I, um, so today I will focus on two things. One is called demographics of this planet. The other is called uniformity. Demographic just means I just want to give some sort of key statistics we learned about this planet and how they relate to other fields of uh, planet formation and so on. Um, uniformity is, uh, typically when I give this talk, uniformity is where I spend almost all the time. Today I'm going to change my tactic a little bit. I spend most of the time in demographics and less time on uniformity. Even though the result I consider is very, very interesting, but because the demographic stuff connects up more to people, what people would hear. But for the uniformity, um, if you have to leave early, the bottom line of the uniformity is this. Okay? This is the Kepler planet. They spend a large range in sizes. And then according to this picture, they also spend a large range in mass. But that's an illusion, as I said. By uniformity, what I would like to claim is that all these planets here they all have a single mass. Okay. I'll spend uh, probably the last quarter of my time arguing that particular effect, and also what does that mean? What does that teach us about planets emission? First part, demographic. The most important thing you want to know is that what's the probability of star, given star to have Kepler planets? The number in the end is 30%. But the development towards that 30% um, takes two slides to explain. The first slide is easy. Okay? Once the Kepler satellite gone up and find all this planet transiting, <coughs> all you need to do, like Andrew uh, Gilden showed very early on, is that all you need to do is to ask how many planets we see and then divide it by the number of stars we know, we observe, and then you can figure out how many planets per system. It's very easy. You get a very nice number. Typically in the Milky Way, that direction, about one planet per system. But that number, very interesting as it is, is slightly different from the question I'm going to ask. The question I would like to ask is that, but given star, what's the chance you have a planet? Another way to say is that, what's, what's the number of planetary systems in the mean it could have? By that, I meant that, well, some stars could have, as you can see here, some stars have, well, everyone looking at a lot of our planets, some planets have five planets. And some have three, some have even have seven. So the distribution planet is definitely not one star, one planet per star, but very unequitable. What we really like to know to make any kind of theory is that, in average, how many stars have planets? Okay. So we go about this problem. Uh, people, ha there have been a lot of. Um, uh, research, including people here, in this particular problem, I will only just describe our approach and also our results, so it's a bias. So this is how we approach the problem. The reason this uh, one planet per star doesn't tell you the true story is because some system can have more than one planet, some system can have zero planets. So to be able to find out the true answer, you will have to figure out this thing called intrinsic multiplicity, or intrinsically, each planet system, how many planets it has. And that turns out difficult. Because even though we see a lot of multiple planet systems, that's only apparent multiplicity. That's not intrinsic. How would you figure out the intrinsic? To be able to break the degeneracy between the apparent, well, break the degeneracy of all kinds of geometrical effects and figure out the intrinsic, you have to need to introduce new constraints. And the constraint we introduce is this. So this shows the constraint we introduced. The blue bar, I believe, uh, the blue bar <coughs> is uh, multiple systems of Kepler. Kepler data, for example, 
Ms. Mubar says that many of the Kepler systems observed as a single transitor. Here, uh, quite a number of them also observed as hanging two in the same system. On and on and on. So we see a large number of multiple systems. But as I said, that's not enough to constrain intrinsic multiplicity. You have to introduce something else. That something else is the orange bar. This is what we call the TDV section. What this is, is this, okay? You can have a multiple planetary systems, and if two of the planets are close enough, they're gonna inter introduce perturbation on each other. So by the time the transit comes in, the planet comes by in transit again, it's not gonna be strictly periodic. The transit times will change. You can see that in the single systems, a lot of, well, 23 of them have this transit timing variation. You can see every one of these little orange bar, which is well documented and measured down to some position. What does that help you? Well, if you can know how many planets have perturbing companions, you can get an idea of how close it is to its neighbors. If you know how close it is to neighbors, you can get an idea of how many neighbors it has. If it's very close to the neighbor because um, there's a lot of planets in the system, then more of them will be producing this transit timing variation. So through modeling, we're able to break the degeneracy, and that's the sort of the red answer is kind of a proud number. We found out that typically, or on average, every planetary system doesn't have one or two or five or seven planets, but about three. Another way to say is that if, uh, if you do have a planetary system that has three planets, then only 30% of the stars could have those systems. So that's the first result. And it's going to come in handy in the later <coughs> discussion, but this is the first part. Um, I think, so uh, just scape out sort of the uh, landscape. Solar system still belongs to the majority at this moment. All right, so uh, the next thing is uh, metallicity. If 30% of the stars have planetary systems, maybe those 30% are the more metal-rich ones. That's the first naive expectation. And that had been shown to be incorrect. Um, as you can see, I'll show a large, there's a large number of studies which have been sh done to figure out the metallicity content of the Kepler host stars. And the bottom line answer is that there's no metallicity dependence. Even though it's only 30% of stars happily, happily hosting Kepler planets, that 30% can be just as well as metal poor as metal rich. There's no preference for metallicity. <coughs> that is very obvious result now because it's now it's confirmed by multiple studies. <coughs> but if you think about it, it just makes no sense whatsoever. Okay. Why, why doesn't it make sense? I showed you earlier, the giant planet have a strong metallicity dependence, right? Those are Z square, and the idea is that because you require more metal in the disk to form those cores. And those cores have maybe 10 to 20 Earth's masses. Saturn has a core about 20 Earth's masses. So what about Kepler systems? They actually turns out they have the same masses. If you have three planets per system, and each one of them about 10 Earth's masses, the mass budget for Kepler systems it's not lighter, in fact, it's worse than mass <coughs> budget for the giant planets. Why? Well, because these systems are, uh, these systems are uh, enclosed in a very small area, less than one AU. In a protoplanetary disk, less than the way one AU a neighborhood have very little mass. So if you were able, you, you're asking so much metals to be stored in those capital planets, you require, naively, require even steeper metallicity dependence, which is we don't observe. I just want to make this point even further. There really is no metallicity dependence. Okay. The title says, oh, there's some metallicity dependence. So this is a work done by a way to uh, one of my collaborators recently. Um, this is metal metallicity of the stars. And that's the occurrence rate. This is sort of, this is sort of non-trivially obtained. Um, basically, he did the 30% results, as I told, you, I told you before. But then he split the stars into three groups and redo this analysis and try to see uh, what's the current rate. You see that the current rate, which is marked by these kind of orange bars, does have a slight rising. The slight rising can be quantified by about metallicity to the half power, if you're happy, half power. What could cause such a weak dependence? Um, 
is a formation that's uh, giving you such an intrinsic materialistic dependence? If it is formation, why is it such a weak power? Um, happily, you guys have the local expert here who work on closed binaries. And in closed binaries, we now know that this is the sort of the same metallurgical ring I'm showing on the left plot. You see the closed binary fraction is rising at the okay. same, yep. Can I ask just a clarification question? So if I, if I understand, you're, you're <coughs> saying that you're not challenging the prior results of giant planets, is that right? No. You're, you're talking just about the super Earth. Yeah, I yeah. think the, I'm, the, the previous result, the, the Julian's goes like metallurgical square is very solidly established. But the interpretation is saying that's because you need more metals to have more material to form the core. I think that's wrong. And it really needs rethinking. It's probably more related to some other physics. OK, so one is rising, one is dropping in the same metallicity range. And in fact, if you put the same thing, two things together, one is rising, one is dropping, you add up, the sum is the same. It's constant. <coughs> so, and you may hear more of this uh, from Maxwell and uh, Caitlin and so on. They also propose the same idea that it's very likely the weak metallurgic dependence we observe in the left figure has nothing to do with the fact that it's nothing to do with uh, material requirement. It has everything to do with the dynamical environment. If you happen to form binaries at 10 AU or also, those binaries seem to have a detrimental effect on the planet formation. And because binaries tend to form a more metal poor environment, the gravitational stability prefer metal poor, so they have a, such a rising trend, and that exactly explains why there are fewer planets around more metal poor stars. So this is not my result, but it's very interesting that sort of two directions from different fields are coming in together and explaining this dependence very well. However, we are still left with the same question. Why is it the Kepler planet don't care about metallicity? Um, in that sense, uh, Arizona is a great place to come to because quite a lot of people here work on protoplanetary disks. In protoplanetary disks, from my impression, is that the field is uh, changing. People used to think that disk has certain masses, which is somewhat similar to, to the protoplanetary disk has a mass similar to the sort of minimum mass solar nebula, which is the disk mass of the solar system implied. We now may be changing that into thinking disk has way more mass. If a disk has way more mass, if the observation really pan out, maybe that will help us to deal with the mass budget in forming Kepler planets. So that's sort of the hope, and we're working on that direction, but more data help. OK. So that's the second uh, demographics. I went through two statistics, or well, two uh, results. One is the 30%, the other is the metallicity, no dependence. Any questions? Yeah? Just uh, trying to reconcile that with the Pettigora at all, the big size. I thought I remember mm -hmm. that yeah. was a stronger dependence, and I'm just trying to rec put those two together. Yeah, so one of these results is Pettigora result. So this one. Okay. So if you can look at the um, so Kepler planet, we sort of separate into two camps. One is called Super Earth, one is called Sub Neptune. Super Earth is a smaller one, Sub Neptune is a bigger one. You can see the Super, super Earths have medium is metallicity zero, which means they have very weak <coughs> dependence. Sub Neptune here, um, that result actually has been changed now after the Gaia result, so it's actually also gone down to zero. So even the Pettigrew um, study is agreeing that there's very little metallicity dependence. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. I just remember the slope of the mass, the metallicity of the yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's, um, there's th this is, uh, this is I, I would say this is the most recent result, uh, where it's the result, which shows this metallicity dependence. We actually are amazed, it sees it. Um, but this takes a lot of work. Yeah. This metallicity for the stars came from both, I think this mostly came from the Chinese LAMOS survey, um, which is well calibrated, yeah, which is well calibrated to the California Kepler survey. So in that sense, both surveys are similar with metallicity dependence. Yeah? In terms of the mass budget question, 
I guess there's always the possibility that right you're not seeing you're not seeing all the planets because they're in the mm -hmm. Arctic system. You're seeing one population that's out here. You're seeing another. Mm -hmm. That the fact that the Kepler planets require as much mass as the giant planets is not that right. That could be not true in principle, right? It could be that the giant planets have either wider orbit companions or close in companions that are you're not seeing, or that the okay. Kepler planets have other. I mean, yes. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I'm going to comment it by the third point. Okay. Okay. Which is, we know giant planets have a strong matter's dependence. We know capital planet has no matter's dependence. How does this two population uh, mean? What, what's the correlation between the two? Do they talk to each other? Do they happen just independent of each other? Is planet formation the inner system and outer system completely detached? To answer your question, it turns out Kepler systems know about the giant planet on the outside. And actually, that gives us a way to understand how the giant planet must also depend on come from. Okay, so this is two studies uh, which was uh, published last year and investigating exactly this question. If there is a Kepler system around a star, let's say that's one of the 30% lucky ones and have a Kepler system, what about the outer range of those? System. Do they have giant planets? Um, let me show this result first, because this is, uh, we, we did the, uh, we sort of dig into the archive, but this is actually dedicated to uh, our researchers. So this is a uh, California team led by uh, Marta Bryan and Herbert Nussin. They look at Kepler systems. So stars with Kepler system, stars which don't have any known Kepler systems, and ask how many of them will have giant planets on the outskirt. You see the ones with Kepler systems? A third of them have giant planets, giant planet companions on the outskirt. In comparison, um, average stars in the Milky Way, sort of like, if you don't have any prior information about a Kepler system, they have about 5 to 10 percent chance of having a giant planet. And those are, the, of course, we know those are the really mega rich ones. So giant planets only exist Sorry, excuse me. Giant planet really do care about Kepler system. We do the same study, we get the same result. Um, we look at the RE systems and look at ones with known Kepler systems and ask how many of them also show RV signals of giant planets, about a third of them. So once you have a Kepler planet, your chance of having a giant planet is much improved. What does that mean? I'll try to use a cartoon to uh, put these two results into an easy mental picture, okay? 30% of stars, so three out of 10 stars, have those uh, inner, super Earths, sub Neptunes, and so on. And if they already have those, what's the chance they're gonna have giant planet? I said it's one third. Both studies show the same thing. So that's easy, one third. But that's actually not the most surprising thing. The most surprising thing is to think the other way. We know that <coughs> out of these 10 stars, only one star should have a giant planet because the giant planet occurrence rate is 10%. We already take up that one star. Another way to say is, oops. Another way to say, I don't know where, what happened to this thing I want to say. Well, another way to say is, there's no other giant planet anymore. Any time the system wants to make a giant planet, it first has to make those Kepler systems. I'm not sure it's conditional, which one's conditional on what, but giant planet only exists exclusively in systems with Kepler inner systems. In fact, the materialistic arguments, materialistic data suggests that, we already know the materialistic data, and they're very strong, to suggest that that one out of 10, that one's the metal rich one among the three stars. So these three stars can have any materialistic, you can form them, no problem, and then you pick the metal rich ones to form giant planets. So if you take the, the set of Kepler planets that are in high metal rich, uh, like metal rich systems, then what's the fraction of those that have giant planets? <coughs> like in the wizard? Yeah, so, so the, uh, exactly, high, right? exactly. So this uh, turns out, this, uh, this ones which we found, so uh, that's another way to say it. So this ones which we see Julian and companion, they all metal rich ones. You can check by the metallicity and it works out, yeah. So uh, this is the puzzling part. 
giant planet only happen in Mrs. Stone's inner Kepler. So we confirmed this result, which is so surprising, anti-intuitive. Um, this is anti-intuitive because we talk about the mass budget. Giant planet needs mass, solid mass to form their core. Kepler planet needs solid mass to form. So you would think the two are in competition. So you would think the two are actually mutually exclusive. In fact, before we study, study our study, I suggest to weigh that, look for the anti-correlation. He found correlation. Uh, so we're definitely unbiased in that regard. Okay, so this is another supporting study of exactly what happened, uh, of exactly what I said before. But this supporting study just takes a little bit of a sort of change of brain mindset, okay? So now what we do in this study is that we take uh, all the Kepler stars, all the light curves uh, from the Kepler satellite, regardless whether they have any Kepler planets or not. Okay, we take all the light curve in, and then we look for transit by planets outside few AU. So outside few AU, those planets, if they transit in the Kepler uh, mission, they only transit maybe once, maybe twice if you're lucky. So this is a really rare event, very hard to uh, sort of, uh, takes a lot of work to just sort of, um, to ascertain their planet and so on. So we found about 15 candidates. Those are the 15 candidates we found. Out of this, about a third of them or half of them are giant planets. Um, there are lots of giant planet candidates here because they are much easier to find than planets down here. So in reality, this planet is actually probably more populous, smaller planets. Those ones are rare. But among those giant planets, out of five, three of them have no inner Kepler systems. Okay, what does that mean? This is what it means. If you are alien and you see Jupiter transiting the sun and you ask, what's the chance I'm going to see the inner solar system as well? It's the probability of that happening is 3%. Even though the inner solar system, we know it's there. The probability, the geometrical probability of happening is still very small. Um, it helps a little bit these planets are so close to their star. So um, if you have a um, giant planet transiting in the same plane and the inner system, What's the chance the inner system going to transit the star? It's about 30%. That's exactly what we see, 30%. Another way to say is that every one of those giant planets should have inner Kepler system. Questions? Yeah. So Christine, if you were just to do a transit survey of RV gas giants, yeah. the planet posting probability would be, or the planet detection rate would be Higher. purely given by the geometric exactly. probability. Exactly. And so tests will be able to tell. So tests will be following up all the known giant planet hosts. And because of this probability, because they already have the inner system, all you have is the geometric probability. So 10%, 30% of them should uh, transit. Uh, so we can be proven wrong in about a year. <laughs> or we can get famous. Unlikely. OK, so that's the really surprising result coming out of this uh, sort of simple statistical study and makes you really wonder, um, do we really understand planet formation? I would argue we don't. Okay, the first thing is that I would say, the fact that this kind of core, this kind of planetary cores, which are equally massive, occurs at all distances, more or less equally probable, means there's nothing special about slow line. It's not like only outside the slow line, you can form massive cores. <coughs> okay, that's the first thing. And the other thing I would make sort of analogy to is that this inner outer system um, correlation is actually very similar of debris disks. This is uh, another good place to uh, learn about debris disks. In debris disks, people have found that whenever you see dusty asteroid belts on the outside, the chance of having a dusty asteroid belt on the inside is very high. Another way to say is that inner and outer solar system, inner and outer planetary system talk to each other. So. Um, Why is that? Um, we spend a couple of years, hopefully, to understand why that is so. But in the meantime, I have this embarrassing omission. I put it really small so you don't see it. Renu may be able to tell us why. We are the, we are the exceptions. OK, so that pretty much sums up all the sort of um, statistics I'm going to discuss today. Just to make it uh, a bit more graphical, 
turns out that we now know the architecture of uh, we now know the architecture of planetary systems around about half the stars in the Milky Way. Thirty percent of them have the Kepler system, and some of them have giant planets. And then twenty percent of all the twenty percent of systems are actually what we call closed binaries, so binaries from one to fifty AUs perhaps. And for some reason, those systems do not form planets, uh, do not form capital planets. So that's half the stars in the Milky Way. What happened to the other half? They don't form planets, and it's not because they don't have enough metallicity. So why don't they form planets? Any suggestion would be welcome. OK, I'm going to move into the different topic now, so I call uniformity, uh, because I've heard the word diversity a lot in the, this uh, area for planet formation. People kept on saying planetary systems are diverse, very diverse. It's, uh, okay. So I like to uh, play the devil's advocate and argue that planet systems are actually very uniform. And by uniform, as I get alluded to early on in my talk, is that despite this, uh, what this axis says, um, mass, this is actually the wrong mass because we don't know the mass, which is the size to infer mass. Despite these differences in sizes of these all different planets, they all have a single mass. And that mass is eight Earth mass. Okay, so I'm going to go into that story. It's a uh, little bit convoluted because we come to this uh, understanding after a few, so, um, through a few years of work, we didn't just arrive at it right away. We actually took a lot of wrong terms and uh, have to make a number of small steps along the way. Okay. This is uh, some of the early work we did and uh, also other people did in inferring masses of those Kepler planets. In this case, the mass of the planet is measured either by radial velocity, so that's a really painstaking work. Um, those planets' mass is so small, this is density, by the way, not mass. Um, those planet masses are so small, doing radial velocity is torture, mm -hmm. but you can see uh, they uh, work through the torture and give them all sorts of uh, RV measurements. The black points is what I call the transit timing variation measurement. We can also measure planet masses by the fact that neighboring planets perturb each other and use Newton's law to figure out the masses. As you can see that the measurements show you a trend. What's the trend? Well, this is the orbital period separation. This is where all the capital planets are. And the right axis, sorry, the vertical axis is the density of the planets in such a way that if the planets are very close to the star, they have densities pretty much like, okay, with compression. They basically have a density which indicated they are fully rocky. No volatiles whatsoever, okay? But then as they go to further and further distances away from the star, they can have lower and lower densities. In this case, Water density, uncompressed water density is one, so they actually can be lower density than water. Uh, when I first got this result, um, that was actually our first result, I was in Beijing in summer at 35 degree temperature, humidity 89%, and uh, I couldn't figure out a solution, and I was really uh, anxious, very annoyed. How come such a correlation it must have a simple explanation? And then I step into air conditioning room and the solution comes to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why uh, um, the Prime Minister of Singapore used to say the air, air conditioner is the single most useful invention in human history. Okay, so this is a solution. Uh, okay, I didn't show this very well here, okay? This is a solution. Imagine you have uh, planets. Okay? Initially, when planets were formed, Imagine they all form a different separation from here to here, all kinds of separations, and they form with a range of densities. By this range of density, what we actually do is that we have a core, rocky core of a planet, and then add a range of hydrogen helium mass on top of it. If that's the case, um, far away planets will just stay with those hydrogen helium mass, and therefore can have a range of density. It can go from very low to very high, just depending on how much hydrogen it has. But closer planets, because they're close enough to the star, they experience the X-ray bombarding by the star, 
they're being peeled off at the surface. The hydrogen helium can be peeled off in the first 100 million years. As a result, you're left with a bare, naked, rocky core in the middle, and therefore the density goes up. That's a simple explanation. This is what we call uh, photo evaporation. Um, because of that story, it makes me realize that there's, uh, even though we call them different names, we sometimes we call something called super Earth, something called sub Neptunes, but really they're the same thing. Sub Neptunes is just the one still retain its hydrogen, and super is the one that lost it. So there's really no distinction. Another way to say is that this planet may be the size of a core, so a couple Earth's uh, radii. This planet, because it's got the hydrogen, it's quite a bit bigger, twice bigger, but eventually they're really the same object, same mass. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the hydrogen and liquid results, the fact that at long periods the, uh, um, the TTB planets are, are more, you know, typically um, lower density at longer periods, I mean, is, is yeah. this indicate, I mean, mm -hmm. how is this not observational bias? There's a, so there's an observational bias here because it's a long period, it transits <coughs> fewer times. As a result, the transit time in precision is less good. We can only do the transit timing very precisely if the planet is very big. In other words, you only catch the really big planets, and therefore they're very fluffy and lower density. So this part, I think when I was doing it, I stopped here. Uh, this part is a bias. So but this part is a not. Trend, even in your, you know, yes. Even Yes, bias. so it, that's accounted for in the analysis, saying what if I don't have good enough signal noise for the small ones? Am I missing the small ones? Yeah. And the RV, don't, which don't have the same selection effect, shows the same trend. Okay, uh, if you don't buy the photo evaporation, let me show you another piece of evidence. Okay? Um, so this is the same sort of same kind of theor theoretical plot I showed earlier, but instead of the density, now I show radius of the planet. As you can see, um, the lower populations, what we call the super Earth, the upper populations, what we call the sub Neptunes for some reason. And in this theory, when we first put it out, we didn't even notice there's a feature in there, which I now highlighted with a gray bar. As a feature, um, the feature is because in that neighborhood, the planet has so little hydrogen, it's mass, it's almost naked, but not quite naked, it has a little bit of hydrogen. And that hydrogen actually has a disproportionately large radius, as a result, that hydrogen is the easiest to be stripped off. So any planet in that gray bar will just quickly go through it and become a super Earth. So they don't like to stay in that gray bar. Uh, as I said, I didn't even notice that feature in the data because back then when we put out a paper, that's how the data looks like. There's no feature. Not only there's no feature, if you look at the error bars of the data back then, 2016, there's no hope to seeing that feature. Fortunately, uh, observers are always inventive and always willing to do a lot of hard work. So this is done by the California Capital Survey, where they turned that figure into this figure. What did they do? They actually took a spectra of each host stars using CAC, um, high resolution spectra, and determined the radius, uh, log G really, of each star. And they determine the radius, that means if you have the stellar radius, you can figure out the planet radius much more precisely, the error bar shrink to that. Um, I hope that's the evidence to convince people that for the evaporation seem to explain. Uh, so we end up doing, with the better data, we also can do better modeling, and we were able to sort of nail down, so to reproduce the, those kind of observed size distribution of planets what kind of a primordial planet we produce. By the way, so this is, uh, just so that we know the terminology, this is a super Earth again, but this is sort of between one and two Earth radii. This is a sub Neptune, and then there's a valley in between. You can also see the same features, but in, um, in the size distribution. So this is the, now instead of plotting in two dimensional, I just plot one dimensional. So that's the super Earth peak and that's the sub Neptune peak, and then in between there's a bit of a valley. You say that doesn't look much like a valley. Well, it's true, it doesn't look much like a valley because that's the old data from Kepler using photometry to determine size of the star, and that's in 2016. 2017, thanks to the Kepler team, uh, California Kepler team's uh, work, 
The Valley looks a little bit more like a valley. 2018, Gaia result came out. What's nice about Gaia is that um, you get it for free. You get the data for free. You don't have to put in any telescope time. You get the radius of the star for free because Gaia has now done the sort of black body fit of the star's uh, surface radiation and diameter distances and everything. So Gaia knows the radius of the star without doing any spectroscopy. The valley now is much more distinct. What I would like to do in the next couple of minutes is use the Gaia data to show something new that we learned. Uh, before I do that, um, I, let me add a bit more uh, supplementary information. So this is the Super Earth Peak. This is the one that which were uh, very close to the star and therefore lost its hydrogen envelope. And you see the dip here, which is the valley that I discussed. And then this is the sub-Neptune Peak. And it's about twice the radii, they still retain the hydrogen. This tends to be further away from the star, lower density. From the super Earth, you have the advantage that if you know the size of the planet, which you can, as you can see here, you can right away infer its mass. Why? Well, as I said, they're rocky. You have some idea how composition looks like. So a rocky planet, if it's one Earth's uh, radius, then it's one Earth's mass. Um, if it's bigger, the mass radius roughly goes like this. So mass goes that radius to the force power. So radius right away give you the mass. And this. Um, conclusion I would like to draw to in the end is this size distribution that you see here actually can be even simplified further and leads to the conclusion that every one of these planets have the same mass. Okay, so this is the first step we use uh, Gaia data. Um, this is the before Gaia. You can see the planet radius versus stellar radius. Now I introduce a new variable instead of a period. Now the horizontal axis is mass of a star or radius of a star, which is sort of synonymous. Okay. With the older data, even though with the big powerful cat telescope um, data, you see no trend. You see that more or less this, the, there's a, you see more or less there's two high of planets, um, but there's don't don't seem to be any correlation between planet property and stellar radius. With sky data, you're starting to see more. The, the, the error bar has gone down. We can see that there seems to be a tilting up. I'm gonna show more data later on to make this clean, uh, more obvious. But let me show this one. This is the uh, same data. This plus the same as that one, except I added the line to guide your eyes. Not only that, I added the data from MDORF. So MDOR data is a sort of from a separate data set. As you can see, MDOR planets are smaller than around FGK stars. Um, the famous Trappist one is here. Famous Trappist one is here. The planets around that MDOR, 0.1 Earth mass, is even smaller, falling exactly around these two lines. This is the super Earth line, that's the sub line. Another way to say is that there is a seem to be a, a linear relationship between radius. Well, there seems to be a simple relationship between planet mass or planet radi radius and stellar mass. As I promised, I'm going to show you more data to convince you that there is such a trend. Um, this is now uh, back to the sort of planet size versus period before. I've shown you this kind of plot before. You see the super Earth clump on the left bottom and the sub Neptune on the top right, the two clumps. Okay. And what I would like to do now is to disperse it into stellar, different stellar mass bins. Low mass planets, high ma sorry, low mass stars, high mass stars. Buying it, not buying it. So it, it looks more like it's stretching out at high masses rather than the peak is shifting, but. Yeah, it's a. Uh, well, peak is shifting. This is the peak here. I can just draw by line. Draw, draw by line, that's the highest density. And not only this peak is shifting, this peak is shifting the same way. It's sort of they're just parallel shifting, which makes sense if the two are just the same planets. Is that what you were asking? Because why do you get a square that you're going to just a shift in the whole distribution? Square. So I mean, if you look at the left, I 
like the bottom of the orange contour to the top of the orange, like one of the orange contours is more squished than the Oh, the shape. Yeah, 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 the yeah, shape. It's just like yeah, 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 the shape, yeah. Um, yeah, the shape, detail shape is very, it's not terribly similar, but um, as you can see, the number of points is not that great. But the centroid is shifting. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I would like to. And I just want to remind you, mental image, because I'm very, oh, sorry. The mental image is probably best represented by this plot. It's, this one is sort of collapse the period. Don't worry about the, where the planets are in the period, but only look at where the sizes are. I think because of that, you get rid of those noise, and you can easily see the shifts better. Okay. Where am I getting at? Um, I'll discuss what I'm getting at, but before that, let me present you some more uh, evidence to say that the shift, well, sorry, much of this is still very much noise dominated. If we can somehow reduce the noise, it will get even clearer. What do I mean by that? Um, it turns out that's the overall size distribution from Gaia data. And Gaia has an error bar, as you can see that the red error bar is over there. It's about, Gaia error bar is about, Five to ten percent. It turns out for a subset of the Kepler planets, we have error bars three percent because we can measure the seismology uh, signal from those stars. So we know the radius really, really well. We have three percent error bars. You can see that size distribution and this size distribution. That really indicates that if we get able, we're able to measure the stellar radius precisely for every one of those, we're not going to see that size distribution. We're going to see something much narrower something perhaps more akin to two delta functions. Um, this is also the same thing, but doing a different analysis, so we cut the data different ways. Turns out Kepler systems, some system, some planets we consider more primordial, less change. Some systems probably changed by planet instabilities or mergers and so on. So we cut away the ones which we believe are changed, which is the red ones. We're left with the more primordial systems, and you can see they're also much more sharply picked. So uh, whatever dispersion we're currently seeing around those lumps and so on, much of it is probably instrumental um, noise and also uh, some uh, post-formation variations. Reality is probably we have two sharp delta function peaks. OK, so this is where uh, I'm going into a uh, speculative mood, where I'm trying to say, why is this? What's, this, what's the significance of this result? The fact that the planet mass goes like stellar mass with the normalization is eight Earth mass. That's a number, uh, I think it's a metric number. Um, if you form capital planets around the sun, if you ever do, this is the only kind of mass you can form. This is very different from, let's say, galaxy formation. If somebody tell you, say, in galaxy formation, the only kind of galaxy mass you can form is the nuclear mass, nobody else, that's very strange. Okay? That's what we're seeing in capital systems. There is a dispersion around the eight Earth masses. Currently, it's about a factor of four in Fulvis half maximum. But as I said, I expect that to get smaller as we get better and better data. Another interesting thing is that this, uh, so if I just take the super Earths, uh, the sub-Neptune is just twice of those. <coughs> so they just have the same information. So if I just take this, the data really says that this Planets are very distinct population in the sense that the numbers of planets going to small size and going to large size really falls off. That's what I mean by the delta function. They really prefer single mass. There's not a continuous distribution of planets here. This is where Earth is. And that's why I said earlier on, Earth seems to be very distinct population from the capital planets. They're not really part of the same zoo. Why is it that more massive stars breed more massive planets? What explains such a simple linear relationship? Let alone what explains the dispersion, but what explains such a simple linear relationship? Um, right away you say, well, um, if you know about probable function disk, you, you, you will argue that, well, more massive stars tend to have more massive disks. Maybe more massive disks is what give rise to more massive planets. It turns out that doesn't really quite work because um, more massive disk um, probably contains more solid. But as a result, um, 
that more massive disk um, going around more massive stars is a very, very crude observation with a huge spread, two other magnitude spread. Any single star is forgiven mass, even their stellar mass can have disk mass varied by two other magnitude. So that's not going to give us the nice tight relation observed in Kepler system. You can also say, well, maybe more massive stars have more metallicity, have higher metallicity because they form more recently. And that also turns out not to be the explanation. So the single tight relationship between planet mass and star mass is not explained. What is it explained by? Um, this is not the answer. I can only say what it's not explained by. For example, in the case of how Earth is formed, we have a theory called terrestrial Earth formation theory. What we have is that you have about two Earth masses of solid in this Earth neighborhood, and you let them gravitationally interact with each other, collect and grow, and make bigger and bigger planets, and we end up with the terrestrial system that we see. In those kind of scenarios, there's no way we can form the capital planet. First, there's no way in that scenario that the planets you're going to form cares about the stellar mass. And second, in that scenario, whatever planet form you form, they're going to just depend on how much mass you have available, not depending on that single quantity. So none of this can explain this relationship. I'm running out of time, or uh, running out of patience. Um, this is really my, uh, uh, what do you call it, wild geese chase or whatever. Um, I'm desperate. I don't know how to explain those. So I get a linear, we, we got a linear relationship within a week after the Gaia data was public, but it took me a couple months to come up with this slide. So uh, it's probably highly vulnerable to attacks. Okay. So in this slide, what I would like to do is trying to make some sense of that eight Earth mass. So obviously there's a characteristic scale, characteristic mass scale that defines this capital planet, but what's that mass scale? Let me more pick it in, this, in terms of mass ratio. So planet mass divided by stellar mass. Why does it have to be that number? What's the mass ratio come about from? There's only one mass scale I could think of, although uh, actually I heard another alternative solution today. Um, there's one mass scale I could think of. That special mass scale is called the thermal mass. So what's the thermal mass? You imagine you have a protoplanetary disk, which is supported by gas pressure vertically, and therefore has some pressure scale height, vertical pressure scale height. So that's a spatial scale. And if you say, well, if that pressure scale height is the size of the planet's Q radius, that gives you a characteristic mass scale. So I think, uh, compare two models, this is the this is the radius of uh, away from the star, and that's the temperature of the disk. So uh, there, we don't really know how hot the disk is. So there are a couple models. I showed two models. This is how hot the disk is. Given the temperature, you figure out the scale height. And given the scale height, you figure out what kind of planet mass or the thermal mass correspond to. This is what this thermal mass is, OK? So for example, for this particular model, which we call the plastic radius model, at 0.1 AU, characteristic mass scale or mass ratio is about 10 to minus 5. The observed one is up here. It's a couple times higher. And there's an also another model, which is uh, we call active accretion, active accretion gas uh, model. And that lies above the observed characteristic mass. So this is the only thing I can think of. Another way to say is that to me, the most likely interpretation of the result was that every capital planet is made with a thermal mass. It's not like any mass can go. Like the terrestrial system, you can have Mars, Mercury, Earth, very dramatically different in mass. But in Kepler system, there's only one mass. OK, um, why do planets have to be thermal mass? This point, I totally give up. I have no idea. In fact, uh, in July, uh, we're hoping to have a workshop uh, to discuss why is it that when we make planet in the protoplanetary disk, the capital planet, not the terrestrial ones, which are made presumably in a gas-free phase, 
why is it in those environments when you make any kind of planet it better have one single mass a solar mass um, so I'm not going to show you all my uh, um, doubts and my uh, trepidations about this topic it's a very rich topic there's been a lot of work done on what kind of planet mass you expect and I think the data is now telling us where we should go okay this is my last slide and that's it I put three Y's there because we don't know what our results mean. But the hope is that now we now know which direction to go. And thank you for your attention. So there's this uh, evaporation gap is uh, sloping down, like the data. So the same data can be used in smoke, right. depending on the precision of the stellar one to do. Wow, and okay. And it's much more precise than the Gaia data. Yeah, Gaia is uh, 5 it's to 10, which is not. Precise. But it's amazing. Yeah. Not very good. Good, okay, I should look it up. It's uh, impressive. <laughs> okay, um, in fact, uh, well that's, I think you had Yves Lee here uh, a couple of weeks ago who uh, was a PhD physicist. Um, short answer is that I think our understanding of gas accretion probably has to be revised. Because of that, we don't really have any predictive power that they should or should not become gas giants. On the other hand, I will turn this question a little bit to the question which I'm very keen to answer is that why do Jupiters care about metallicity? I already showed it to you that form core masses of 10 Earth masses doesn't require metal rich stars, doesn't require metal rich environment. Any star pick it out of the galaxy, even if the metallicity is minus 0.5, um, you know, three times below the sun, seems to have enough solid material in its disk to form capital planets. So why in that case, Jupiter only happens in metal-rich ones? Andrew may be able to tell us in a couple of years when we actually finally understand the gas accretion process. There may be some effect, the gas accretion is affected by the metallicities. So yeah, sorry for not answering that question. Uh, yeah, we are at the early stage. Yeah. Oh, that helps. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean obviously one of the things that people, I guess including me, have suggested how metallicity might help giant planet formation is that it's not the total amount of material, but it's the timing. It's just like giving a, a head start to planet formation, mm -hmm. it's really planetesimal formation. Mm -hmm. you, you start planet formation early, which is what you need to be able to yeah. uh, keep the gas. Okay. Um, but uh, oh yeah, there's your, there's your gas giant. Uh, That's my gas giant, but let me show you another population of planets which I didn't talk about today. So you would say, well, maybe gas giants forms outside. And if it's very far away, the dynamical time is very long, and so therefore you better make it very metal rich to make sure the time scale is short enough. That would also predict that the, um, at these large distances, the metal poor ones should have nothing. They actually have. They have lots of Neptunes, which have about the same mass as Jupiter's cores. So the so the right right so the question is that um, once you reach the idea current ideas and once you reach this critical mass for runaway gas accretion the time scale to accrete gas is nothing right that must be wrong. Well, if if, if the gas is still there, then you reach that mass. right. Yeah. So uh, that's why I put on Neptune. So those are ones have ten percent or twenty percent, even 30, 40 percent gas. So we, the reason we know this existence of these planets from that long period Chinese survey I was talking about 
And as I said, we actually measure their sizes. Because when we measure the sizes, we actually measure how much hydrogen. So they seem to have a lot of hydrogen. It's just not runaway. So yeah, there is a constraint in that direction. You can't just say, uh, when you say metal floor, you don't mean, I mean. I don't mean minus like, three. Yeah, you're talking about yes. minus a tenth of a deck, minus two tenths yes. of a deck. Yes, minus 0.5, right? minus half a deck. Minus half, okay. Yeah, that's the lowest bin that we have. So, so that's the lowest, but when you said yeah. you still have You mean this one? Yeah. This one? Yeah, when you were answering Andrew's question. So yeah, so uh, the giant planet exists on the so the one the, uh, the one presumably if you think of the first star as the one that's like plus half, the middle one zero and the lower one's minus half. That's sort of the rough feeling we get from our data. Is that not very metal poor for you? Uh, I just didn't remember the, the spread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not very big. I thought it's it was close to Yeah, so that's it's not because right, right, right. So we're limited by the the, the cap in the Kepler direction. The few the spread in metallicity was not well Very narrow. narrow. The number of host stars was not big enough. But among that spread, which is about a factor of five in metallicity spread, we see no difference. While the same metallicity spread factor five exhibits as a huge difference in giant planet occurrence rate. Yeah, sure. So you need to put more stars on your plot to increase the hot Jupiter, right? Oh, so hot Jupiter is only 1%. Right, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So you need to have too many stars. So <laughs> That's right. are you just sweeping them under the rug because they don't happen? Or can you say if you think there's any, if you think even at 1% they give us any leverage, or should we just stop talking about them? <laughs> <laughs> I stopped working on them. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know, actually. Um, yeah, they are, they're kind of statistical minorities. Yeah, and they tend to be very metallic, as you know. So yes, they give us some creep, but probably the same creep as those cold Jupiters. Am I allowed to ask more questions, or uh, I can just go on? So where is the microlensing? Yes, very good question. Yeah, microlensing. What does microlensing say? I was actually very excited about it. Michael Lansing um, turns out to discover uh, about together maybe about 20 planet candidates. And Michael Lansing has the advantage that you measure mass ratio. So I plotted the mass ratio here. Interestingly, that mass ratio is exactly lying along the thermal mass. I don't know if that's uh, <coughs> something deep or just. Uh, But your question may be something else. Well, right? You think that it's actually pointing to a characteristic mass rather yes. than simply mass. Yes. I think it's, so my glancing the result is saying is that um, there are very few Jupiters, and then there are more and more Saturns and more and more Neptunes, and then the mass function suddenly has a drop. Well, it doesn't go on, it has a drop. So there's a characteristic mass where it drops off, and that's where this is. Okay. So the hypothesis I would like to test is that perhaps if you form any kind of planet in gas disk, which includes the Kepler planet and microlensing planets and the core of Jupiter and Saturn, wherever you form it, they have to be thermal mass. Otherwise, they were not going to survive. The moment data suggests supporting it, but perhaps with more data, we could uh, really uh, test the hypothesis. Whether why thermal mass mattered for the survival, We solve it in July. Okay. All right. Thanks for listening.